The tiny house community is growing tremendously. With over 30,000 of them listed on Airbnb, tiny houses are a valuable part of the Airbnb community as well as the people that host them. As more and more people are looking for unique accommodations on Airbnb, the need for these types of homes are growing. I've met countless Airbnb hosts of tiny homes, each with a unique success story. So let's meet Rob, the owner of this tiny house located in Joshua Tree, California, and hear about his hosting experience, his advice in starting the unique home experience on Airbnb, and learn about how much money a popular tiny home host makes. What's up guys? Welcome to Casita Conejo. I'm here today with the owner Rob. He built this home and runs it on Airbnb. He also has a couple other Airbnbs like in Los Angeles and Arizona. And like I said in my tour video, if you haven't seen that video, go check that one out where I tour this 300 square foot tiny house. Rob, I love your tiny home. Tell me like what even inspired you to do this? Yeah, so I built a tiny house in Los Angeles when I first started. I moved to LA and I'm a writer. My wife's is, my wife is a teacher and you know, we wanted a way to supplement our incomes because there's only so much money you can make in those career fields. And buying a house in LA is very, very expensive. I built a tiny house in my backyard and everyone really, really liked it and everyone responded well to it and it was booking well on Airbnb. So I thought, well, considering so many people like this house, what if I did it? better you know and yeah. so I basically spent twice as much money on that on the house here because I had to buy land I had to put in a septic system and I had to you know pay for so many more components but for me when the first tiny house took off you know just from a conceptual standpoint of people liking it it bringing in good revenue I knew that I was kind of on to something and Joshua Tree was the next target for me and so I decided to do it here and blow it out as best as I could. So your first tiny house was in the backyard of your home in LA, right? Mm -hmm. And then how much did that one even cost to make? So that one was an ADU, uh, also known as an accessory dwelling unit. So basically it is part of my property, it's got its own address and because of that I was able to save a little bit of money because I didn't have to buy land. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a lot of people move to LA and think they're gonna buy a piece of land in the hills for like $50,000 but what they don't know is that that's on a cliff. So I was able to <laughs> utilize my backyard and save a lot of money there. So that house cost $72,000. And wow. then uh, whenever I moved out here, the land here is obviously much cheaper than in LA. So the piece of land that we're on specifically was $12,500. Wow. Bringing the total construction to $165,000. So just over two times what I spent in LA. Wow. So you saw your tiny house in LA starting to do really well. Tell me about your hosting experience on Airbnb for the past couple of years. You seem like a pro by now at it. Definitely. So I started with my LA apartment, then I quickly graduated to a studio under my house and that was paying half my mortgage. So that's kind of where that started. And I just had this crazy idea, what if we put a yurt out in the middle of the desert? And so they were just sort of like, sure man, if you, if you feel like we need to do that, let's do it. <laughs> like they always trust my crazy ideas. So we put a yurt out there and that ended up just being like, like a home run from the very get go. So then we were like, well, what if we put two yurts and then like a big yurt and an Airstream and an A-frame. So that quickly developed into like this really cool glamping um, campground. Yeah. <laughs> uh, which is glamorous camping for anyone that doesn't know. I feel like everyone watching this probably knows. Yeah, but. glamping. So we set up a glamp site and that went really, really well. And basically we were going to move out there right before Corona and really expand that into a 32 acre glamp site. Mm -hmm. But you know the industry sort of changed forever. Yeah, you know? really. Uh, not really. I mean, it, it did, but if you're a smart host that is able to adapt and everything like that, I think it turned out mostly okay for a lot of people that didn't over leverage themselves. So yeah. that was great. And then I built this tiny house and then I built a small home, which we'll go see in a little while, about three minutes away from here. Yeah. Um, that's not quite so tiny. It's a 800 square foot small home, okay. um, but still small. Mm to Texas standards, which is where I'm from. Um, and then, yeah, and I just bought a chalet with a couple partners in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. So all in all at this wow. point, I have about 10 different listings. Wow, you do have a lot of listings and I did do a tour of all of those glamping spots in Arizona. If you wanna go check those yeah, out. We'll link my... them right here, right here. <laughs> if you wanna go check those out on my channel, but tell me, you mentioned the COVID. What was your experience from pre-COVID to now afterwards, how has it been uh, doing all that? So COVID at first seemed like it was gonna be a little scary. And then I switched my model to my LA tiny house to hosting only travel nurses. Oh, okay. And so since wow. that point, I've been booked 100%. Wow. Now when it was travel nurses specifically, sometimes I'll block three days because that was the Airbnb minimum at certain points mm -hmm. uh, for COVID or whatever. But that's been booked 100%. 
This I ended up renting long term. He stayed here for two months and I gave him a, a really good long term rate just thinking like, well, it's, you know, I'd rather just cover bills and lose money. Mm -hmm. And then another guy came and stayed uh, a month after that. And then so this was like right before July. July is when I reopened my calendar for the entire month. Since July, I've been 100% booked. Really? Yeah. Uh -huh. Between, do you think it's more of like local people or like people just traveling from anywhere? Well, I think a lot of people were pent up in their houses and they were kind of getting cabin fever, understandably. Yeah. So the way that the industry is changing for Airbnb specifically is I think that people are starting to realize that they can't just hop on a plane anymore, go to you know Europe or mm -hmm. you know wherever, right? They wanna hop into their car and drive to the nearest small town. So we get a lot of people coming from Las Vegas and Los Angeles and kind of all the surrounding areas because they're tired of being home. Mm -hmm. And so for them, this feels like a little secluded. And the same thing with our glam site. We get a lot of people from Las Vegas and Phoenix that mm -hmm. are coming in and they feel like they're getting away from the city and they're getting away from kind of like the COVID mm -hmm. that you know comes along with that city and they're able to disconnect a little bit and enjoy themselves. Mm -hmm. And so I think the industry is kind of moving to these kind of unique stays specifically mm -hmm. or um, more off the grid or desert experiences. Yeah. So being a host on Airbnb with all these homes, you've definitely had a lot of guests come through. Tell me about your some of your best guest experiences and how that can be like really uplifting as a homeowner letting them come stay with you. Yeah, so at this point I think I've hosted over 2,000 people or so. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's been super awesome and there's always a unique aspect of every guest. The guest experience has been so great because when you run a glam site, you really are helping families kind of like disconnect and connect with each other. So for me, my favorite aspect of Airbnb and even running my glam site is reading the reviews. Mm -hmm. We have so many people that say that they cozied up by a fire playing you know, board games with their kids, or they got to look at the night sky through a telescope yeah. and see stars with their kids for the first time. We've had people propose, uh, you know, in our yurts. So it's been really gratifying in that regard. And there isn't really one specifically, because if you read our reviews, most reviews mm -hmm. go in depth about how they had this amazing opportunity to be secluded with their friends. Being a host is not just being creative with your design, but being creative with guests. If you have a problem with guests, you know, on site where they're unhappy with something, it's a great opportunity for you to think outside of the box and make them happy. So a lot of times, you know, uh, having a glamp site, if something goes wrong, we can show up in person, attend to their needs. Just last night, my co-host brought someone a bottle of champagne and, you know, for them, what they thought originally would be a three-star experience really changed their entire stay. Wow. So it's just little things like that can really, you know, be gratifying as a host on Airbnb. Yeah, definitely. Stepping out of your way to provide for the guests, I think mm -hmm. is really awesome. That's your number one job on Airbnb is making <laughs> sure that guests are happy. So no matter what it costs, no matter you know if it breaks up your dinner at night because you have to go attend to it, that's your job. And if you do it correctly, then the rewards will always outweigh the unrewards. <laughs> True, I agree. <laughs> so you mentioned the industry is moving towards unique stays, which I totally agree. So is that why you kind of, what, I guess sparked your interest in the tiny home or alternative home style. What sparked that? I've always had a fascination with tiny homes just in general. Like I really like them, but they're always like really tiny, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so for me, I, I mean, it makes sense in the name, but for me, I wanted to build something that, you know, if you ergonomically design it as a permanent structure on a fixed foundation, then not only are you building like a cool, tiny home, but you're also building an appreciating asset. Mm -hmm. So I know for a fact that, you know, this house cost me $165,000 to build, but in 30 years from now, it's gonna be worth significantly more than that. So now back to this tiny house in Joshua Tree where we're at. First question, why Joshua Tree? This is like, I've never been here before. And I always saw pictures and really cool, but it is kind of out in the desert. So why here at Joshua Tree specifically, since you live in LA? I think Joshua Tree has some of the most out of box experiences and some of the quirkiest and funkiest places to stay. Mm -hmm. I am a little bit competitive in the Airbnb space. I feel like, you know, I tried to be at the top of my game in Airbnb. And so I felt that the city would force me to be competitive and make something that's cooler than everyone else. Now I'm not saying that it is, but in my mind, I was like, that's my goal. I mm -hmm. have to, I have to go toe to toe with the world's best designers and architects. And so for me, it was just a way to fuel my creative like fire. Yeah, I agree. There are lots of cool ones here, but this one is definitely really cool. I think it really intrigued me. So and your favorite, right? It's been like, yeah, exactly. got it on camera. <laughs> now into the financial side of things. He said this cost 160,000 to build. And how often are you booked here? 
So, so far I've been booked 100% since I reopened my calendar during COVID. So July and August, I have been booked every single day, but in, in September, I'm already booked like, I think the first 20 days or so. Wow. And then I just got my first booking for October. So I predict that I'm probably gonna run 100% booked, but that's just because I think that this is like a destination for mm -hmm. people. I think, you know, my video for this house took off. And so I mm -hmm. feel like I've gotten a lot of people reaching out saying like, I really want to stay here. And so that has definitely helped my bookings like stay pretty consistent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this, he has a video of this place on his YouTube channel. Shout out to him, Rob Built. Mm -hmm. And he has a, other tours of his other tiny houses. So go check those out as well. So now the big question is what, how much money does this tiny house specifically bring in monthly? Right, so when I was first booking in the pandemic, that was bringing in a long-term uh, rate of $1,500 a month, which is very low, but again, I just wanted to break even. Mm -hmm. My expenses for this house kind of run in the $1,000 to $1,100 range every mm -hmm. month. That's what it was for July and October. And in July, I, uh, I netted a total of $2,800. Mm -hmm. And then this month, I netted $3,300 wow. roughly. And I get into those numbers in, in the video that you were talking about. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm thinking for September and October, it's just gonna be more than that mm -hmm. because I've raised all my rates significantly. Well, not significantly, but enough to accommodate demand. So if yeah. you're booked 100%, your rates are too low. And so <laughs> I just wanted to establish you know, a lot of reviews and everything like that. Mm -hmm. So. Basically, July and August, my rates were 159 to 189 a night. Yeah. And then in Dang. September and October, I've raised it to 199 during the weekday to 225 on the weekends. And mm -hmm. then in October, I've got it all at 249. That's nice. So if I book out moving forward at at least $200 a night at the current rate, it'll be a gross of $72,000. And then if my- um, 7,200? No, no, like if I book $200 a night, like I had 100% occupancy. Oh, okay then my yearly oh, gross yearly, profit okay. will be $72,000. Wow. And then of course I've got expenses, which are about $1,100-ish. So a profit, roughly speaking, of like 55,000 to 62,000-ish on this house. <laughs> wow, and this is only one house. So if you have a couple, that could be like a full-time thing, right? Yeah, I would say on both tiny houses, like if, if I'm booking them at short-term stays specifically, then it could be like in the $80,000 profit range. So moving forward, I'm hoping to make $55,000 to $62,000 on this specific house. In a year. In a year. Wow. Yeah. So if people do have a couple of Airbnbs like this, or even just like one, I guess, this you could see this as a feasible full-time job for somebody. Oh, definitely, yeah. I mean, uh, it's a snowball, so you gotta start small. I mean, I've been doing this for three years, and it really has been a full-time effort for me, mm -hmm. but I have not paid myself any of this money. Like, mm, okay. I have made decent money on Airbnb, but it always goes into building tiny houses or the glamp side or anything like that. Yeah. So, while it's great to make a lot of money, uh, if you need it, then it's awesome passive income. But, you know, I'm just trying to sacrifice a little bit more for the next, like, three to five years so that five years from now, I can be solely dependent on this income. Man, that's awesome. So, this definitely could be a feasible full-time job. So, what would be some advice you'd give to somebody that wants to start in the unique home genre or maybe just wants to become a host on Airbnb? What would you tell them? A lot of people suffer in this industry from what's called analysis paralysis, and you overthink every single detail and you're scared of what if, what if, what if. The only way you can overcome that is by going through those problems every day and figuring it out on the spot. You're never gonna be ready to do Airbnb until you just start hosting and you really have to just be able to be adaptable and flexible. So my advice is, I was talking to somebody one time about my DIY uh, efforts and how I just start projects to commit to them. Sometimes you have to punch a hole in the wall so that you commit to fixing that wall. So for me, I think Airbnb is kind of like that. You have to just dive in. So whether that's buying a house, building a tiny house, doing a unique structure, I think the first thing you wanna do is figuring out, figure out what your budget is and what you can buy with that. So if you have $5,000, that can buy you a yurt. We've already solved that problem. Mm -hmm. Now you have to figure out where to put that yurt. And that's where a lot of the work comes, right? You have to contact people on Craigslist, different landowners, you know, parents, friends who have land available and ask them, can I put my yurt on there? And then you have to find a cleaner, then you have to find a maintenance person to come and fix things. So it's a lot of little problems that you mm -hmm. can figure out little by little. But the first thing you have to do if you're like really serious about getting into glamping or anything like that, buy the yurt or the bell tent or whatever it is. It can cost you anywhere from three to $10,000 depending on what it is and then figure it out. Because if you try to figure it out before you ever make a purchase, you're just gonna keep putting it off and you'll never actually get started in the industry. I agree. Well, that's awesome. I definitely wanna get into the Airbnb side of things and maybe become a host of my own tiny house one day. But we'll see. Bye bye.
of your Levi? My year. Yeah, you just gotta start, man. <laughs> you just gotta do it. I know that's what I tell myself. But that's really cool. I think if you are interested in that, I think you should totally do it because becoming a host on Airbnb sounds like it can become a full time job if you want to do something like that. The tiny houses bring in big money, I would say. Yeah, and it's really fun too. I mean, as much as it is a job, like for me, I'm a creative at for my career. I'm a creative copywriter, and that. I always thought was like the ultimate form of creativity. But whenever you're in, in Airbnb, you're a host, you're setting up your house, you're designing it, you're picking out murals and weird rabbit photos, whatever that is. That to me is like the ultimate version of creativity because no one can tell you no, mm -hmm. except for my wife. She tells me no on some of my design <laughs> choices every so often, but it is for the better. Airbnb is definitely about collaboration. And so for me, like I feel like I have a really great creative partner with my wife we can come in, design a space, and mm -hmm. I know that it's gonna razzle dazzle the Airbnb world. <laughs> and to me, like, it's so fun to do that. The money part of it is cool, but considering that I haven't really paid myself from it, what really keeps me going in this is that I get to make creative decisions that nobody can veto. Yeah, I agree. That's why I like the whole YouTube platform. Anyway, I hope this provided some valuable information for you guys. Uh, check out his videos on his YouTube channel. They're really good. I'll link them down below. It's Rob Built, and I'll leave his Instagram right here as well. You can go follow him there and his homes as well on Instagram. If you have any questions, uh, shoot them over to him and he'll probably try his best to answer them. So yeah, definitely thank you so much for being in this video and let me stay and tour this beautiful tiny house of yours. If you're interested or want more information about hosting your unique space on Airbnb, check out the description. I have a link down there below. Thanks for watching.